There we go. We're recording now. I apologize for that. All right, Melissa, take it away. Well, thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. And I'm glad we got everything working. Sometimes it just takes a little bit more to go in the morning. I get that. Um, it's a busy time of the year. So thank you all so much for joining us today um, for our second session for Teaching with Teens. Um, my name is Melissa Hortman, um, and I just wanted to introduce myself with my camera on, but I'm going to uh, turn my camera off to save bandwidth. Um, during this presentation. So um, today we're going to be talking about um, how to lead engaging meetings or classes basically where everyone participates. We're going to be talking about a lot of different features and functionalities within the live Teams meeting environment and Teams as a whole. Um, so just a little bit about me. Um, uh, I am uh, an industry executive, which basically means that uh, my role at Microsoft is to help support um, our teams within Microsoft and build that bridge to higher education. So I uh, actually came from higher education. I was in higher ed for about 12 years. Um, most recently, I was an associate professor and the director of instructional technology at the Medical University of South Carolina. Um, so I've done a lot of different uh, classes and teaching and a lot of different modalities. And so I'm really excited to talk to you about um, how you might be able to leverage some of the features and functionalities within Teams to um, to maybe make your make your meetings a little bit more or Teams meetings, which are your classes or anything like that, a little bit more engaging. And so the way that I'm presenting this is through live PowerPoint uh, presentation. So all of the links um, on the screen are clickable and accessible. So um, I'm, I have lots of different resources throughout this entire presentation. You can pretty much Google anything in this presentation, but what the value that I hope that we can, uh, but that I can bring and the conversation that we can have today will be centered around the usability of these tools and the application of them within your environment. So thank you for sharing um, your roles and where you're at. It uh, looks like we've got a great group um, from a lot of different areas. Um, so we'll try and talk to that uh, today. So I wanted to recap from uh, last week's training. If you weren't able to make it or if you were able to watch the recording, um, we talked about uh, how you can leverage teams within teams. So the meta teams, basically, I like to call it uh, and uh, how you can kind of build out a team for students to create community, have conversations, share files, collaborate. Um, either for a class, for a clinical, for um, a student group, whatever it might be. There was a lot of questions about when should you use Teams versus an LMS. And I think uh, from my perspective, what I found was the most beneficial is just finding finding the different features and functionalities that really stood out to me in the different tools. Um, so when I was teaching, um, I taught 100% online, but I leveraged our LMS, which was Brightspace, and for my teaching, because that's where all of my content was, that's where uh, my assignments were th was through. But what I did was I also leveraged Teams to enhance that environment. Brightspace didn't have some of the features and functionalities that I wanted for creating that community and um, kind of some of those one on one conversations, a one note notebook to share resources, different things like that. I supplemented with teams um, and I think that that is one of the best ways to kind of think about what you do is how can I leverage the different tools that I have in front of me to to support one another. So um, so I think coming into this presentation, I really wanted uh, the aim to be, what are some of those tools that are out there that might be unique to Teams um, that, that you can leverage in a way that maybe will hopefully make your life a little bit easier? Because um, I found some of these things made my workflows and processes with my students, with my administration work a little bit easier. So um, we're going to be going through 15 different <laughs> opportunities and tools um, over this next uh, about 40, 45 minutes or so. Um, and as I go through these, please feel free to put your 
questions or use cases in the chat. I want this to be interactive because um, I want this to be about you and to be make sure that we're getting all of your questions answered about all the different ways that you can leverage teams within your within teaching. So today I'm really focusing in on those the live teams meetings, like I said, what we're in right now. Um, and so to start out, there's multiple different ways that you can create meetings. You can create a teams meeting through your outlook. You can create it through the teams environment itself. And if you do have Brightspace and that integration, then you can um, use Teams through Brightspace. And so let's focus in on Outlook first. If you've used Teams and Outlook, I think some of the benefits of using or creating Teams meetings that way is some of your external contacts will show up there. So if I know that I'm having a meeting with people outside of my organization or I'm con I'm connecting with um, an outside speaker for my class, I would I would schedule that through um, my Outlook just because I know that I have all of those contacts saved there. If you schedule within the Teams environment, it's a lot easier. You can the scheduling is really great to look at everyone's schedules to make sure that it aligns. Um, you do have to put in people individually. So if you have like a listserv for your students or a class list uh, listserv, um, you'll want to do that through Outlook that won't be recognized through Teams. And then that third way through Brightspace, um, one of the things that I found if you do have this integration is making the meetings through um, through the calendar so that they show up uh, as um, notifications in the in the Brightspace app. So um, so I think one of the most important things is making sure that you have the right people in the meeting um, and the easiest way to schedule it and that they are getting that notification that that meeting is coming up. Um, so I'm saying meeting a lot because it's a Teams meeting, but think about this in the class aspect. So you can create all of your class meetings for the entire semester um, through Outlook in a few clicks, as if you were creating a, you know, a reoccurring meeting for, your, for a, a group on campus or your department. So you put in the title, who's going to be there. Um, you can set that reoccurring time uh, so it'll constantly show up on everyone's calendars. And then um, you send it out to your group. And that's really great because I think, again, the easiest way that you can kind of get these things done, the better. Um, so this gets it on their calendar. It gives them the link. It creates that space that's going to be reoccurring throughout the entire semester. So I think think about how you're creating those meetings, um, where you want to create them the most efficient way and um, and how you want it to look. Is it a, a once uh, a, a just a meeting in time or is it a reoccurring meeting? So the question about um, creating channel meetings. Um, so there's not a way to connect it back as a channel meeting. You have to create the meeting within the channel itself um, for it to be a channel meeting. The benefit of that is you have all of the conversations uh, and chat kind of as a package within that team itself. If you do create the one-off meetings or a reoccurring meeting, it'll show up under your chat area in your left rail in Teams. Um, so if you do set up a reoccurring meeting or a, a meeting in um, Outlook or Teams, um, you can just grab that link to that meeting and put it within your channel as a post. That's probably the best way, but there's no way to link things back and forth. Great question. All right, the next a uh, piece of setting up your meeting. So this is all before you get to the meeting itself. Um, you can create uh, some meeting options and um, meeting options, like I said, can be updated before the meeting and with a new update that just came out in Teams, you can on the fly um, also adjust those 
options during the meeting. So for example, last week, uh, Chris uh, changed the um, audio. So right now, um, audio is muted for all participants in the meeting. Um, and then she turned that off halfway through so that participants were able to um, speak. So on the fly is just as well as pre-meeting. Um, some of the things that I would look at before your meeting and um, all of these options on the screen might not be available to you right now in your tenant, um, but they are coming. Um, so just to be aware, there's lots of different things happening in meeting options right now. And I think one of the most exciting ones for me um, is creating a co-organizer. So co-organizers um, basically have all the same permissions as you who are scheduling the meeting. So let's say you're an, your administrative assistant is creating the meeting or scheduling your classes on your behalf, but they're not going to be in the class every, every time that class meets. So the administrative assistant would then add you as the faculty member as a co-organizer for that meeting. You'll have all the high level roles and permissions um, within that meeting. So that's just one example, but um, other things that you could set up before a meeting that I think is really helpful is a, a meeting lobby. Um, so I've used this in a lot of different ways for a lot of different use cases. Um, and so what I do is uh, usually I'll schedule the meeting, then I'll go into my meeting options. And if this is for a class, I'll make it so no one else besides those that have been explicitly invited to the meeting can can go through the lobby. So it'll kind of create a, a good buffer space for if anybody's trying to get into that meeting that shouldn't be in there. Another use case is um, I worked with our IRB group and uh, we wanted all of our IRB participants, our PIs that were applying for IRB to go to the lobby and we would admit them one by one to have those conversations with them. So if there are private conversations that are happening, that lobby can be really, really helpful um, for kind of just managing who gets in and who who should not be in that meeting at that time period. Yeah, thank you, Chris. And the Q&A module for meetings, there's a lot happening in these areas um, and so, so many more meeting options that are coming um, down the pipeline. So definitely um, stay up to date with, uh, with what's available to you now in your tenant and what's coming because I think that this can also shape how your, how your meeting looks, how your class looks. If you are starting out with a lecture um, in your class and you want to mute all participants, you can do that beforehand or on the fly. Um, then when it's discussion time, you can unmute people. You can start to see how these meeting options can be really, really helpful to actually almost simulate what it might look like if you were in the classroom and everyone had that same sort of experience. That's a great question, Laura. Um, I'll actually share some um, opportunities at the end for two great places um, to, to keep up to date with some of what's coming or what is already out um, because there's lots and lots of stuff in the pipeline. All right. So the next thing is people management. Um, so I find that this is really, really helpful um, when you're in a meeting. So let's say you set up all of your meeting options and um, you leave off the mute. So everybody can come in unmuted and can participate, but there's that one person who might have their dog barking in the background and you're trying to do a lecture, you can go over to that participant list as an organizer and um, and mute them. So there's three little dots next to everyone's name where you can change their role, manage their permissions, all of those different things. Um, you can mute people, you can ask them to come off of mute. There's so many different options within um, within a meeting that you can kind of, again, grow and shape and how you want that meeting to be run. Um, so with 
with that, especially um, one of the things that I like to do was to have um, a, a designated student for every class be my people manager. Um, because when you're in the virtual environment, trying to lecture, trying to keep up with all of the different options and features and mute people and unmute people, keep up with the chat, you want a moderator like Chris, like Chris is in this meeting, right? So, and Kurt is helping to answer questions. You need additional people in that virtual environment to really make it a rich, rich environment for the participants. Um, so I, I always chose a student for each class and they would kind of be that lead student. I would make them um, a, a presenter in the meeting, not an organizer, right? So think about your roles within the, the meeting because there's lots of different roles that people can have and access that they can have in those roles. So if I make a student a presenter, they're able to help with muting and unmuting. Like I said, um, they can also help share content, uh, share links, all of those things. So think about, again, all of these options, the way that you want your class or your meeting to be run and what support you might need to be able to do that. All right. So next up is our live captions and recording and transcriptions. So live captions is different than transcriptions. Uh, live captions is something that is available to, um, to you as an individual that you can turn on um, and you can select your language. If you do turn on your live captions, it'll be on the top. Um, under the three dots like Chris talked about, and you can turn on your live captions from there. The live captions will give you fairly accurate word for word uh, of what the presenter is saying at that time. It'll also identify the presenter, um, whoever is talking. It's similar to transcriptions, um, but I'll get to that in a second. So live captions, like I said, is for that individual. If I turn that on, you won't see it. If you turn it on, I won't see it. So that is something great that um, is available to anyone that's in a meeting, participants, organizers, anyone, uh, to turn on those live captions for, for them. I turn on live captions in every meeting that I'm in. Um, I'm that kind of person who just uh, is able to retain information better and um, and stay focused when I'm reading the content versus hearing the content uh, keeps me really engaged. So I recommend that for some of my students that um, might have a hard time focusing in on the content just to turn on the live captions and and keep those on during during the the session. The other option is uh, and available to you is recording and transcriptions. So uh, now Microsoft has made it so when you start your recording, it automatically starts a transcription. A transcription is a word for word, very similar to the live captions of what's going on in the meeting, um, anything that's said, it's tracked and, um, and after the fact is put into a, a Word document basically that can be downloaded and accessed by anyone that has access to the meeting. A few thing about few things about transcription that I I really like um, is um, we would use transcriptions in a lot of our just departmental meetings if we needed um, to be able to look back at what happened during that meeting and I didn't have time to watch a whole recording. I could just access that transcription, search for specific words, see who said said what and actually call that out. It's a really great way to kind of enhance your meeting notes, um, which is word for word. Um, so I found that those are really great for that. Exactly, minutes, um, all, all of those things. It's great because now you're not having to take minutes. While you're in a meeting, you can really focus in on the meeting. It lets shift over to the class aspect. And so a transcription in class can be really powerful for those students who might not be able to focus during the lecture. 
Um, if you are recording it, they want to go back and watch the recording or they want to go back and read the transcription. Again, those transcriptions might not be um, 100 percent accurate in terms of some of the complex language. So if you are teaching a pharmacology course, it might not pick up some of the different drug names that you're talking, but it is AI based, so it will learn. Um, and I think that there's a lot of benefits to having that transcription afterwards. I would pull that transcription after the class and allow the students to do so as well. And I would upload that to the LMS as you know, here's some resources if you weren't able to um, to access that. So the students will find the transcriptions after the meeting in teams um, and I'll actually get to that uh, in, in later in this presentation on where they can find those. Um, they can't be edited in terms of everyone uh, seeing the edited version. Um, they can download as a Word document and they can edit those if needed on their own. So if they did have to um, write in the correct drug name or seek and find, you know, anything that might not have come over correctly in terms of the language and catching that with the AI, um, they can go back and edit that. That'll be saved locally on their computer. Um, so transcriptions can be iffy, right? So if you don't want uh, students to be able to access those things, you need to think about that. Um, you can actually turn off transcriptions and still record. So you can do both. You can do one or the other, um, or you can do the other or the one. So it's a, it's a nice option to be able to have if that is, again, enhancing your class and providing value to the students or those that are attending your meetings. All right, here are some other great things um, that I wanted to call out. So the large gallery view um, is uh, if you have nine or more people who have on their cameras at one time. Um, the large gallery view, if you do select this, it's in your um, drop down with the three dots um, for more. You can change over to the large gallery view. This won't show up as an option unless there is more than nine people that have on their cameras. Um, so it might not show for you right now because we all have our cameras off. Uh, so this is great because if you do change to this large gallery view, this is just your view. So when you change, it does not change for everyone. Um, they are still seeing it the way that they want to interact with it um, because there are some additional features that I'll get to in a moment as to everyone wants to interact with a meeting or a session differently. So Microsoft, per, Microsoft Teams provides that option to be able to say, well, I want to see everybody because I'm the teacher, right? And I'm the faculty member and I, I want to make sure that I'm seeing all of my students at one time while I'm presenting. So like I said, if I'm going to be presenting and seeing my students, you might want to have more than one computer to be able to do that um, or get on your phone to be able to uh, see the chat, any of those things. Um, but the large gallery view is just for you. Another option is the together mode. Um, this is a little different than the um, the large gallery. So again, this is a, uh, a view just for you. So if you want to see all of your students as if they were sitting in a lecture hall, basically, um, you can turn that on and this is how you'll see your students. Uh, so it's just another option for how you view uh, your participants during a meeting. The next option is pinning. Um, you can pin any one individual uh, camera that's on. Um, so let's say I wanted to pin the professor because they and I'm a student. I wanted to pin the professor because I wanted to see their camera uh, and see them talking, but I also wanted to see the presentation. I can pin different pieces so that I can have my view. So pinning is something that only affects what you see. 
this is a huge benefit again, because if I want to interact with the presentation in a certain way, um, I can do that. I can pin who I feel is, you know, the the most important people to me to be able to see uh, in my view. So again, another great way to kind of uh, customize your view for a session. So spotlight is something that does affect everyone. For example, let's say you're in a class and um, you have a guest speaker that's coming to chat with the students. You could spotlight that speaker so that everyone sees that speaker on their screen. They will be they will be what's on the screen for everyone. Um, I think that this is really important when you want to make sure that everyone is focusing in. So you as the organizer or presenter, um, so let's say your your lead student for the week can get in and um, spotlight the important people in the session. I think that uh, again, this is just a really great way to focus and keep focus on what's important. The next options are raising hands and reactions. Um, so any one individual can raise their hand uh, during a session. They can also react. Uh, so let's start with raising hands. Um, raising hands is something that uh, when it goes up, it stays up and then you manually have to put it down or a presenter role or above can put your hand down for you. Um, there have been some enhancements to the raise hand tool. So now when you raise your hand within the participant list, you'll see the order of when people raise their hands. I, this is really great for when you have a question and answer time for people to be able to raise their hands and you to be able to call on people in order of when they raise their hands. Um, just a, a, a way to engage um, your students or your participants in a meeting, making sure that you kind of have a, a good um, uh, handle on the meeting and, and what's going on. The raise hands kind of keeps keeps things in order. Um, and then the reactions is just a way that everyone can kind of, you know, is everyone following me? Can you give me a thumbs up? Um, it's very similar to what other tools have. So it's just a point in time, just it shows up all over your screen or over your um, name, and then it goes away. So it's just a way for the students or your participants in your meeting to interact. You can turn off reactions and keep on raise hands. Um, if it is getting uh, interruptive in your class or you know, you're doing a lecture or something like that and you don't really need those reactions, take a few steps back to that meeting options area and you can turn off reactions there. Um, so lots of different options for your participants to engage in the meeting. And what I would recommend is giving them kind of the guardrails on using these sorts of tools. So like I said, is everyone following me? Can you give me a thumbs up? That's a way to engage your audience or your students during a session. Or if you have any questions, please make, make sure you raise your hand in the next two minutes and I'll, um, I'll get to people in order of when they raise their hands so that we can have a, a good discussion time over the next 10 minutes, something like that. So giving people kind of prescriptive ways to use it does really help so that you, again, can kind of manage your meetings. Um, the next option is chat and reply. And so we use this a lot in the last meeting. We're using it again in this meeting. If you go to your chat area and um, look at what Kurt did, uh, if you go up two, three chats, um, Kurt replied to a chat. And I think that this is helpful so that you know who's talking to who and what conversations are happening. Sometimes during classes or meetings, there's lots of different things and ideas that come up at different times. So you want to make sure that you're following up with those specific things. To be able to do this, you hover over a chat with your mouse and you'll see different reactions. You can thumbs up, heart it, um, all of those different things that'll stay on that post, or you can click the three dots. The three dots gives you a lot of different options um, and you can reply to a post 
there. So it's the first option there. What that does is it gives you the option to call out what they said and then reply there. Um, perfect. So, and Kurt just did it again, which is a great example. So this is, again, a great way to kind of keep those conversations rolling um, and partner them with, uh, with what was asked or what was said previously. Um, so you can do this, your students can do this. Anyone in a meeting that has the chat available is able to reply to messages. Great question, Laura. So all chats are actually automatically saved. I think this is probably one of the biggest benefits of having meetings in Teams uh, and classes in Teams. If you do create a Teams meeting, um, you and it's within your organization that you're joining that meeting. So let's say uh, you're at um, a specific institution and you're teaching your morning biology class um you join that meeting the chat will stay you know you'll see the chat during the meeting and it's actually persistent even after the meeting this is part of the meeting options as well chats can only be you know edited or added to um during a meeting after a meeting all of those uh it's always open so it automatically makes it so i could actually chat with this Teams meeting and everyone, all the participants in it before the meeting. So if I wanted to say, hey, heads up, everybody, I'm going to be five minutes late to this meeting. Um, one of my other classes is running over. I could do that ahead of time and go right into the um, into that meeting, start the chat uh, without even starting that meeting. And then after the meeting, all of the chats will be automatically saved, like I said, and persistent in your Teams environment. So if you go back to Teams and on the left rail under chat, uh, you'll see this meeting um, if it's within your organization and um, be able to, you can add to the chat there if you wanted, uh, or you can add to the chat within the meeting itself. So I find this really helpful because um, when I am uh, teaching and I maybe didn't get to all the questions that were asked during a meeting. I can go back to my chat within Teams after the meeting's over, um, pull those if I wanted to, or I could reply right within that chat area after the meeting is over. Um, so me, con conversations continue to happen. Um, and I, I think that that's a really, really important thing in classes, especially is you have that natural buffer time before a class and after a class where people have conversations and people are connecting. So having that chat available to them, they're able to get in, talk with one another, ask questions to you and you be available there. Great, thanks Kurt and Chris for um, also showing, yeah, the meeting options. This, so it all comes back to those meeting options, right? Those are really important things to kind of think about and see and use as you're setting things up, but also know that you can change them on the fly. So know what your options are. Uh, so if you don't want them to be able to access uh, or your participants to be able to access the chat afterwards, you just turn that off, right? So um, you can disable that, which is great. So um, I think that um, that's one of the things that sets Teams meetings apart for me, especially for teaching, is having that availability of the chat before, during, and after, um, and it being persistent. I can access it any time in the chat area. If this is a channel meeting within a team, um, you can always access the chat within the team channel underneath of that meeting that you um, you made there. So uh, so there's always going to be a way to be able to go back and find those chats, reply to messages, add to messages, chat with people one on one to follow up with them. Um, but I think that this is a really, really great option. So if you're teaching, you're going to be sharing content, probably some sort of PowerPoint or 
uh, maybe a, a Word document or your screen or a web browser. There are a lot of different options for sharing content and a lot of new options for sharing content that um, are really exciting. So like I said, the way that I'm sharing my content right now is through PowerPoint Live. Um, so that means that this PowerPoint is in my OneDrive. And when I go to the share option on the top right, uh, if you're a presenter or above for those roles, you'll have access to that share. I can scroll down and you'll see in the left picture that those PowerPoints show up for me. Anything that was most recently accessed basically um, on my computer, on my OneDrive. So I can just select it from there. And the benefit of this is I have all these different options to be able to um, write on my screen. I can do a red laser pointer. So now you can see my laser pointer. So if you want to focus in on this is where I'm talking about for my PowerPoint Live, this is that share tray. Um, you have a lot of different options for that. You can also write on your um, on your slides. Uh, so that we're on number 11 um, or I want to call this specific thing out. So you can write on your slides in real time and your participants will see that. Again, a lot of benefits I can think about like in anatomy classes where you want to call out something specific or highlight something. Um, you can go through all of those different options um, on the bottom as a presenter. As a participant in the um, PowerPoint Live, you can click on all the links that I've shared in this PowerPoint for you while I'm sharing this in real time. So everything um, that you see on the screen in terms of what is a hyperlink, uh, you can click on and you can um, you can access. But I'll share this. I'll share these slides afterwards, so you don't feel like you need to um, uh, get all these down or bookmark these now. Uh, so, so I would I would just kind of um, sit back, relax, and and pay attention, or you know, if you want to uh, to get into that. Yeah, Kurt, thank you for the fancy stuff. There are a lot of fancy things that you could do in presentations, um, and within your chat, you can. The TA bot, I think, is a great call out. Um, the Q&A, so many different options to customize the experience within the Teams meeting. Um, and definitely, if you want to dive deeper into that, I would connect with Kurt, um, and he can kind of get you uh, resources on that, and I'm happy to help support that as well. Um, one of the other options that I wanted to call out was this picture. Oh, I'm going to do my fancy red laser pointer. This picture on the bottom right. So um, in the uh, when you go to share, I can't do this right now because um, uh, I'm sharing through PowerPoint Live. But if I am sharing my screen or just a, a PowerPoint in general that I've you know brought up or a website, um, I can do kind of this newscaster call out. Uh, you can change your background, your image, all of those things. Uh, it's really great um, because if you are lecturing and you want to be part of that picture for your students, you don't want them to have to pin or do all the different things. You can kind of, I, I call it the newscaster because it totally looks like that. I used this in a, a class one time and the students were just, wow that they could see me and my content at the same time um it also helps a, a little box will pop up for you so you can see yourself as well uh and how that kind of setup looks um so you can set that up i would play around with that i think it's a really really great option there's also new things coming to powerpoint um, where you can embed your video in powerpoint so many things um i think around the corner in really sharing content and creating that engaging experience that um, we've not had previously. Uh, and um, I think uh, I would just practice this before a presentation. Make sure that you can share, make sure that you have your content up in the way that you need it. Um, I always join a meeting if I'm sharing at least you know, three to four minutes beforehand so that I have all those pieces in place in place for me to share. 
Um, the next option is forms. So um, you might know Microsoft Forms as kind of a one off. You can create surveys or quizzes. Um, if you go to forms.office.com, I think it is. Kurt, if you could put the link to Forms directly in the chat for me. Um, but Forms is a is a standalone product um, under your Microsoft 365. But what I like about Forms is it's now integrated into your team's meeting. So you can create polls using forms. Um, and if you click on that link, uh, it'll take you to the step by step on how to create those polls before a meeting. Um, so you can set up all of your polls before a meeting. You can make them live at the time that you need them in the meeting. You can deactivate them. So once you've kind of gotten all the data that you need, you can turn those off. And then afterwards, because this is integrated through forms, um, all of your data will be saved in forms. So your polls are not just standalone polls where it's a point in time, I'm just going to get this data and move on. You can actually, you'll save that data in your forms area and be able to revisit it. You can use it for educational research if you wanted to. You can use it as exit tickets for your class. Um, I start out my class with a poll of, you know, what's top of mind for you uh, from what we talked about last week, and I'll give them some of those options. And that's where I'll start. It's I'll start my lecture. It's just in time teaching. And I think that that can be very powerful for the participants. So forms is uh, if you are a presenter or above, uh, it'll be one of the options. Um, in your meeting options area. So if you go to Teams, all of that will be there beforehand where you can add your polls, you can add Q&A, you can add everything, kind of set up your environment. And then uh, you can also create polls on the fly during a meeting. So I think polls and forms are, is, again, one of those things that really sets it apart because it's not a point in time um, experience is something that you can go back to and utilize and leverage that data for future classes or for your educational research, like I said. All right, so another option for meetings is the whiteboard. Um, the whiteboard is, uh, is something that can be turned on during a meeting um, in live time, and it's basically a, a, a space where you can put sticky notes, you can put text, you can have people draw on it. It's a it's a space to ideate um, all together in real time in at a distance. So I think whiteboard is one of those pieces that um, can make your class more fun, can make the experience more fun. If you have a small group specifically, I think is really good. I would use whiteboard with my team. Um, at my last institution on my administrative side to to connect with them during COVID when we first um, had to all uh, be at home, we still had a space to kind of brainstorm ideas and prioritize um, different efforts and through different color sticky notes and all of the templates that it provides. Um, if you are really into whiteboards, there's a lot of educational research out there about the benefits of whiteboards for um, teaching with your students and how to leverage them, especially in different domains. Um, so I would kind of dive into this a little bit more if you are interested to see if it really fits and enhances, like I said, your class environment. But that link will send you off your way with a lot of a lot of different resources there. Um, the next option is breakout rooms. Um, so Microsoft Teams, maybe I not too long ago released breakout rooms, and more recently there's been some major enhancements to breakout rooms in Teams. Um, breakout rooms can be set up before a meeting happens. So for example, if you have a class where you know that you are going to be um, breaking your students out for small group discussions at some point in the class, you can set all of that up ahead of time in Teams where you'll find your meeting options, set up your polls, all of those things. 
you can do all that ahead of time. Um, you can also set up breakout rooms on the fly during a meeting. Again, this is where your lead student or somebody kind of helping to facilitate a meeting would come into play. Uh, you can set those up, send people on their way. Um, the biggest benefit that I found from breakout rooms uh, in Teams is, remember how we talked about that persistent chat for a Teams meeting? Well, when you have a breakout room, it becomes a persistent chat as well. So I can start to see what's going on in all of the breakout rooms and the chats that are happening within them, and I don't even need to be present in them. You can only be in one Teams meeting at a time, um, so you can hop from room to room. Um, you'll be put on hold in some of those other spaces, but having those chats available to you as the teacher to be able to kind of see what's going on is really nice. You can also send out a message to everyone. Let's say um, you were doing maybe a, a hackathon or something. You can send out a, a message saying, hey, there's 20 minutes left um, for all groups. Please make sure that you start tying up loose ends. Um, send that out and then you can actually end all of the breakout rooms, bring everybody back and have, have everybody back in the same space those chats will stay persistent, so you'll be able to look back at them if you need it. There's a lot of a lot of stuff you can do in breakout rooms. What I would recommend is getting a group of you together to test it out. Uh, breakout rooms can be quite complex, and I think um, especially putting things into place during a live class can be a lot of pressure. Um, so I'm sure there's great groups on each one of your campuses who you can partner with to dive a little deeper and to say, hey, I want to set up a meeting. I want to be the controller of the breakout rooms. I want to test all these things out before I do it in front of students. I would certainly recommend that. I did that with um, with my team uh, before we did uh, breakout rooms with over um, 500 students for an interprofessional event. Um, so we set everything up, we let it run, and it, it went really smoothly because we had practiced. So practice makes perfect, I think, especially in breakout rooms. Yes, so you can set up those rooms before the class starts. Uh, you can actually name them whatever you'd like and assign specific students to those rooms. So they won't actually know what room they're in uh, or be able to join that room specifically. Um, they'll join the, the larger meeting and then you'll break them out into those groups and then they'll be able to see the people within that group. Um, so this is something it's a it's a manual process for each meeting, but if you do have a reoccurring meeting, you can use those same groups over and over and over throughout the semester um, if they do stay the same for your students. All right, so after the meeting, lots of stuff has happened during our meeting, right? We've we've done the polls, we've set up our chats, we've done breakout route, all everything. It's been great. Uh, after the meeting, you can go back to your team's environment and um, all of these options might not be available to you in your tenants, uh, depending on what your IT teams have enabled. Um, but here's where you can access your recording, your uh, notes from the meeting, the Q&A, the chat, the, um, any of the assets that were added, like a PowerPoint. Um, you can see the attendance report when specific people joined and when they dropped. Um, you can access your forms. You can, everything that happened within that meeting is all there for you to be able to review afterwards. And depending on the roles, they'll be able to review specific things afterwards as well. So go back to that roles piece, the meeting options, um, making sure people are in the right roles so that they can see the right things before, during, and after the meeting. What I found with students is sometimes they will um, decline a meeting if they are out sick. Um, and I always say keep the meeting on your calendar so that you can have access to all of these options afterwards. If you do decline a meeting, um, you won't be able to access the recording and all, a bunch of different pieces. So you'll wanna make sure that um, you always tell your students to tentatively 
accept or fully accept a meeting, um, even if they're not able to attend. Um, so, so just as kind of a, a word of warning, that's one of the things that I've learned. But here's your package. Um, and here is what happens after that meeting. Um, and like Chris said, you know, with being in different tenants, um, we'll, she'll be able to send that out. But having that kind of whatever, whatever the after the meeting, what after the class looks like for you is really important. Are you sending out the transcript and the recording? Do they need access to specific things? Do you wanna share that data? How does that look for you? Make sure you download those attendance reports, all the different things. And I'm going to add as a bonus, um, there is one thing that I absolutely love about uh, in chat in Teams, especially if I am with a, a, my department or with a group of students or the students themselves having a meeting, you can create new tasks from meeting messages or from chat messages. So again, if you hover over the chat message and click on the three dots, um, you probably have to be in the same tenant for this to be able to show up uh, or organization for you to be able to show up. So um, you can create new tasks and this is a great way to follow up. So you can set a due date, who it's assigned to, um, what it all entails, and then it'll show up on their in their team's environment after the fact for them to be able to follow up on. So lots of great things, lots of bonuses here. Um, and then just as kind of ways to follow up, Kurt sent a great um, link for Microsoft 365 and where you can see things. There's a roadmap site if you really want to get deep into, you know, what's coming, what's been rolled out. Um, I would caution you on that only because your environment might not be um, fully up to date. It all depends on when your IT department rolls those things out, which is um, strategic for being able to support them. But what I love is Mike Tholfson. Mike Tholfson is a product manager at um, Microsoft. And what he does is he will send out the day that the day of that um, new resources come out in different tools from Teams to OneNote to a, anything that's happening in the Microsoft universe, he'll do a, a quick video on it and make it really accessible. So I use these a lot for myself, but I also send them to my students of, hey, we're going to be using whiteboard next week. Here's some of the features and functionalities on how it how it works. Make sure that you understand this before we get into our session. So with that, I will end because there's lots of stuff here. Um, like I said, I'm going to be sharing these slides. Um, with Chris, she'll be able to send those out uh, and um, and I will open it up um, since we have just a few minutes left uh, for questions. Thank you, Thank Melissa. You, Melissa. You all have, the, have ability the ability to, to unmute, unmute themselves now. You know, it was a lot of information, a lot to digest. <laughs> yeah, Laura. Um, on the there was hold on one second. When you were on the large gallery view slide, mm -hmm. the the students' names were on their picture. Can we do that? Um, so it is in Beta, I think for that um, it should be their name should be showing on their pictures. Correct me if I'm wrong, Kurt. I'm looking up on the roadmap to see what the release date is. Yeah. So it's something that's coming at some point. Yes. Yeah, it's yeah, it's still a little finicky, I feel like with the large gallery view. Um, so so I think that there's a lot more work that they're doing around that area. Um, 
so yeah, I'll we'll uh, wait for Kurt to see what that roadmap might look like for the large gallery, but that's a great question. Thank you. And then Madeline. Um, so all depends on your institution um, and what's supported, uh, but you can certainly create meetings and Teams meetings for classes in Outlook in um, in Teams, and then just post that link into the LMS. You can post it into the content area. You can post it into the calendar area. Again, I always use the calendar because then it shows up as like a um, a reminder to students of this is the day and time that this is happening, even if it's on their calendar. Anything else, Kurt, that I didn't cover? I don't think so. That was super comprehensive. Um, the hardest part about my job is boiling down the robust capabilities of Teams because it's extremely flexible and we continue to make heavy investments into it, specifically in the education space. Um, and it's, you know, however you want to run your class. So some of the videos we put up, like, Lisa mentioned Mike Tolson, I put in his YouTube channel. Dr. David Kellerman has some pretty incredible stuff, right? Like you could just use the basic functionality of Teams or there's some really advanced type of things you could do with, with bots um, and customizations and things of that nature. And then importantly, I think uh, you can repeat stuff semester to semester. So you don't have to create stuff from scratch every single time. Yeah. Laura, I'm going to get back to you on the um, on the names thing to see if there's a way to make sure they're pinned or um, if that's a feature that's coming out or if it's only internal Microsoft right now. So I'm going to check with that and I'll get that answer over to Chris. I've added my email to the um, chat here. If you want to just chat about your class or any of your use cases, I'm happy to dive deeper and, and help support you in kind of figuring out what are those tools and features and functionalities that might enhance what you're doing and, and make your life easier, like I said. So I'm always happy to brainstorm some ways um, that you can leverage some of these tools that are around you. Okay, well, thank you, Melissa. We appreciate your time. Thank you, Kurt. Um, I'm going to stop the recording.